nadie sobre todo Faltan todos, suman todos para todos Todo para nosotros so Soñamos en grande que se caiga el imperio Lo gritamos algo, no queda más remedio Esto no es utopía, es alegre rebeldía Del baile de los que sobran de la danza de y mía Levantarnos para decir ya vas Ni África ni América Latina se suba Un barro con casco con la pizza para tirar el fiasco Provocar un social terremoto en este chat Hello, everyone. Greetings, greetings, greetings. My name is Onya Sanu. This is Weekly Pan African News Live. If I'm just like moving my mouth, I guess you won't be able to hear it, so I'll put it in the chat. But if you have any issues hearing or seeing the show, please drop it in the comments and we will get that fixed. It is a learning curve with the technology. We're getting a little bit better every single time for example we played a song in the beginning um because we learned a new thing so yeah um please bear with us through any technical difficulties and please communicate if you have any issues um hearing me or seeing me or seeing any part of the show um that song that we played at the beginning um was called somosur by anna tiju who is a chilean uh conscious hip-hop artist and it's basically a song about the entire world uniting to destroy U.S. imperialism, to chase the United States off of their land and liberate their people. She talks about Africa, Central and South America, the Caribbean, Southeast Asia, all, and Palestine, all coming together to smash the United States and U.S. imperialism. So it is one of my favorite tracks. It is directly related to what we're going to be talking about today on the show, about the necessity a solidarity and what that looks like in a revolutionary context because truth be told a lot of folks fling that word around a lot of folks for example say they are in solidarity with african liberation but it's very very clear that there is not a broader understanding of what that actually means and so we're going to get into what that actually means today but first of all um there's some things that we always start the show with first and foremost we want to say that we are speaking to y'all i'm using the royal we I'm just used to like thinking <laughs> of, of, of uh, this work as like collective and not individuals so that use we. Um, but speaking to y'all from occupied Tiwa territory, also known as Albuquerque, New Mexico, but we call it occupied Tiwa territory because this land belongs to the Tiwa nation. It always have, it always will. The United States is in fact the youngest empire on the face of the planet. 
Um, it didn't steal the land that long ago. And also, it doesn't matter how long ago you stole something, it remains stolen until the rightful owner get it, gets it back. So this is Tiwa territory. This land belongs to the Tiwa Nation. The All African People's Revolutionary Party supports the Pueblo Nationalist Movement, supports the movement of the indigenous people of this land to get their land back and to decolonize and to chase the U.S. empire out of this territory. We say land back, point blank, period, not a metaphor. Actually give the land back from Africa to Turtle Island to Palestine. So this is Tiwa territory. It always will be. The other thing that we always do to start off the show is that we want to call in an ancestor, an African ancestor. And the reason why we do that is because as African revolutionaries, as pan-Africanists, as people active in the struggle for African liberation, we understand that we are doing work on the shoulders of the masses of our people. I would not be here speaking to you right now. I would not have any of the analysis I have if not for the work of the masses of my people and the work of my ancestors. And so we have to acknowledge them every single day in our work. We have to learn from them. We have to uplift them. We have to tell the truth about them because the society lies on them constantly. So that is why we always, always, always start the show by calling in an ancestor. Our work stands on their shoulders or rests on their shoulders. So the ancestor we're going to call in today is Thomas Sankara. Thomas Sankara was assassinated on this day in 1987 in a coup backed by imperialist powers who were seeking to destroy the revolutionary Pan-Africanist project that he was working to build alongside the masses of people in Burkina Faso. Imperialism saw that and we were like, they were like, we cannot have African independence. We need to be able to have free reign to loot African land and resources. And so they made moves to assassinate, to straight up murder Thomas Sankara, just as he was beginning to realize a vision of independence and revolutionary pan-Africanism in Burkina Faso. So some facts about Thomas Sankara. He was one of the first world leaders to actively promote the rights of women to promote our equal role in the struggle for the liberation of our people and the liberation of Africa. He appointed women to key positions in his cabinet he also sold off all of the expensive goods that the sellout class had accumulated in Burkina Faso. These people who had made wealth and, and ostentatious resources on the backs of the oppression of the masses of African people in Burkina Faso had accumulated all of these markers of, of their selloutness. And so he sold that stuff off. He was like, you can't have that. You're not going to stand above the people. In addition to that, he refused to take foreign aid. Thomas Sankara understood quite clearly that checks, resources, loans from the West, from, uh, from, Europe, from the United States, um, from the UN, come with strings that take away the sovereignty of colonized nations, particularly African nations. And so he said, foreign aid is just another way for imperialism to attempt to control us. We're going to do this stuff ourselves. We do not need the help of the same powers that colonized us to liberate our people, to develop our country. Um, he was fully aware that foreign aid is the foremost way in which colonized nations are controlled under neocolonialism. So he was like, no, thank you. And instead, he gave land to the peasants in Burkina Faso rather than to rich landowners. He made food production increase through to the collective organized efforts of the masses of people in Burkina Faso. And through those efforts, the country was able to achieve food sovereignty and food sufficiency in a really short amount of time, the pretty brief amount of time that he was in power. So Sankara was a really visionary, revolutionary, pan-Africanist leader. And for that reason, that is why imperialism moved to take him out. That is why he was assassinated on this day. But we remember him always. We learn from his example. We call his name. We lift him up. And we refuse to allow this system to define him on our behalf. We will define him for ourselves. And we will learn from his example. And we will make sure that they cannot move against us like that ever again. So once again, the ancestor we are calling in today is Thomas Sankara, and we will avenge the death of our brother, imperialism. So as I said, today on the show, we're going to be talking about a really important topic um, for movements for national liberation, and that is the question of solidarity. 
what solidarity looks like and what it does not look like, what principles we must uphold when we say we are in solidarity with the struggle, what that actually looks like, what we must do. In order to have that conversation, in order to explore that subject, I'm gonna use the example of Cuba and Africa as a positive example of revolutionary solidarity. And it's quite likely, if you are a person watching this from the snakes, that you know very, very little about what Cuba did in Africa and for African people throughout the world. It's likely that you have internalized quite a bit of untruth about what Cuba actually is, about what the Cuban revolution actually is. And so the goal of this presentation is to use them as a model for explaining what solidarity is, but also to inject some truth into your analysis about the Cuban revolution. Because the United States government, both parties, all levels, the media, does nothing but lie about Cuba constantly, just constantly, just like blatant, blatant, blatant lies. So we're gonna inject some truth in the situation, we're gonna explore Cuba and Africa, and we're gonna talk, use those examples to draw out some principles that we must all follow when we claim to be in solidarity with a revolutionary anti-colonial struggle or a revolutionary liberation struggle. So um, bear with me, I'm gonna try something a little bit new with the show, we're doing all kinds of new stuff today. I have a presentation that I wanna show and I wanna have like my face in the corner and like a little, and like a little video, so we're gonna see how that works. So I'm gonna disappear for a second, but you'll see some slides. Yeah, Mike. And now let's see if it works. Yay, cool. Okay, <laughs> look, I'm visible. I'm just gonna um, confirm that this is actually working in the stream. Give me one second while I look on my phone at the stream and see if I can see myself in these slides. Alrighty, cool. All right, so once again, if you have any trouble seeing me or seeing the slides or hearing me, drop it in the comments, like if I drop out, Help a girl out, let me know so I can fix it. So yeah, without further ado, let's talk about what is solidarity, learning from the example of Cuba in Africa. And so a little bit of background about me is that I'm on the National Coordinating Committee of the Vence de Amos Brigade. The Vence de Amos Brigade is a solidarity delegation to Cuba that started 51 years ago, um, right after the Cuban Revolution, youth in the United States who had some sense were like, how do we show up for these people that just fought a successful revolutionary war to liberate themselves. Like how can we be in solidarity with them while the government that we are citizens of and pay taxes to is actively attacking them? And what they came up with was the Benson Amos Brigade. They would send delegations of youth, elders, all kinds of people to Cuba every single summer to work in solidarity with the Cuban revolution. Like actually like work in the fields, harvesting sugarcane, harvesting beans is what we did. Learning about Cuba from like the, work, like the mouths of Cuban people. Um, to get the truth to bring it back um, and also returning when we return to the states like sharing the experiences that we had on the island to inject again truth into the discussion about Cuba in the United States and so this presentation was originally developed for that space for the Vence de Amos Brigade um, and so that is why it exists so let's get started it looks like the slide changed so I want to open with a quote from an African person who directly witnessed and experienced what Cuba's um, solidarity work in Africa was actually like. So this quote is from Nelson Mandela. For folks who are not familiar with Nelson Mandela, probably only like a few people. He was a member of the African National Congress, the ANC, who became the first president of Azania after apartheid was ended. Um, there are very, very, very valid critiques of Nelson Mandela. We're not gonna get into it now because it's beyond the scope of this, uh, the scope of this conversation, but many valid critiques of Nelson Mandela many valid critiques of the ANC, but the fact remains that he was an active part in the struggle to end apartheid in Azania. He was an active part in the struggle uh, for national liberation of African people in Southern Africa. And so he is a good primary source on Cuba's role in that particular context. And so that's why we're gonna quote him right now. I'm gonna read the quote. The Cuban people hold a special place in the hearts of the peoples of Africa. The Cuban internationalists have made a contribution to African independence, freedom, and justice, unparalleled for its, un for its principled and selfless character. Cubans came to our region as doctors, teachers, soldiers, agricultural experts, but never as colonizers. They have shared the same trenches with us in the struggle against colonialism, underdevelopment, and apartheid. 
So this is an African octave once again in the struggle to liberate Southern Africa from imperialism and colonialism and capitalism who witnessed Cuba coming in to assist the struggles that I'm going to be talking about in just a minute. And this is his assessment of how Cuba showed up. He said they did not come as colonizers. They came to fight side by side with us and under our leadership as doctors, teachers, soldiers, agricultural experts, never colonizers. There are very, very, very few powers or nations or entities for which that can be said about their engagement in Africa. Typically, when, when forces go to Africa, when nations go to Africa, when corporations go to Africa, it is to loot Africa, it is to subjugate Africa, it is to exploit Africa. That is not how Cuba has ever, ever, ever shown up in Africa. So let's get into some examples. Um, for this presentation, I pulled out three specific examples um, to discuss in depth. But it's important to understand that this presentation does not cover the full scope of how Cuba actually showed up for us. Um, that presentation would probably be several hours long because Cuba, when called upon by African people, not just in the continent, but throughout the diaspora in the United States, in the Caribbean, in Central and South America, when African people called out for help, Cuba answered with no strength attached. So again, this presentation is gonna go into three specific examples, but as you can see on the slide, there are many, many, many more places where Cuba showed up in solidarity with the struggle for African liberation. And even on this slide, it's not a complete list. But just to go over them briefly, Angola, Azania, which is the African people's name for South Africa, the Congo, Central Africa, Eritrea, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, Namibia, Tanzania, Grenada, Haiti, Jamaica, Chicago, Harlem, New Orleans. So yes, not only did Cuba show up in Africa, not only did Cuba show up in the Caribbean and Central and South America, but Cuba has actually showed up for African people in the United States. Cuba has opened medical clinics in inner cities that were intentionally developed, underdeveloped by the U.S. government at all levels and provided free medical care for the African people living there. In New Orleans, I said in parentheses, or they tried to. So what, what that means is that when Hurricane Katrina hit Louisiana, and destroyed the city of New Orleans, flooded it out, and the US government under President George W. Bush left those people to die. Cuba offered to send doctors and water and temporary, like literally like pop-up hospitals and all kinds of resources to assist, not just in the rebuilding effort, but in the effort to save people's lives. And the Bush administration said no. The Bush administration said we're good. And then of course what happened? Almost 2,000 people died thanks to the failed U.S. response to that disaster. That was predicted. Like, they knew that was going to happen. They knew the levees were going to break. They knew that hurricanes were increasing in intensity thanks to climate change induced by capitalism. They knew ahead of time that this was going to happen eventually and who was going to be impacted, African people. So they knew that shit, but they did not plan anything ahead of time to help us. And then when after the inevitable happened and Cuba was like, do you want some help? The United States was like, nope. And then people just died and were left homeless by the thousands. So that is just a, an incomplete list. Once again, see in red, not a full list of all the times that Cuba has showed up for African people and African liberation. And I'm going to talk about three specific examples in depth. Um, and yeah, if you want to know more about places Cuba has showed up, I will drop some links at the end of the show where you can learn um, in more detail about some of these other places. Next example. So going in depth into three situations, we're going to start off first with Cuba in Africa, Angola. So in Angola, the MPLA or the People's Movement for the Liberation of Angola requested that Cuba come to their nation and provide assistance in their battle against the Portuguese, against Portuguese imperialism and Portuguese colonialism. Cuba was like, word, let's do it, and sent uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of soldiers, doctors, and teachers, more, more than 330,000 Cubans served in Angola in those capacities, doctors, soldiers, and teachers, and more, for a mission that lasted longer than 15 years. So when I am talking about these examples, when I'm talking about Cuba and Africa, I am not talking about like an in and out kind of thing. 
I'm not talking about Cuba showing up for a week and being like, okay, peace. I'm talking about Cuba sending hundreds of thousands of trained soldiers, doctors, teachers, and more alongside weapons, alongside money, alongside military support for extended periods over 15 years. I feel like we have a conception of revolution in the United States where we believe that revolution is like a one shot kind of thing. Like it just like pops off and people just tell you just get like a wild hair up their ass and they're like, I'm going to have a revolution. Um, and then it just like happens and it takes like a month and then it's like done. That's not how it works. Um, revolution is a protracted process. Even when you get into like the armed struggle part, that process is slow and long with forward movement and then backward movement and then forward movement and then two steps back. It's like very, very, very drawn out. And so when and the MPLA was like, come here and help us under our leadership and Cuba was like, yeah, Cuba was signing up for the long haul. And so this mission that lasted over 15 years where 330,000 Cubans served in Angola as once again, doctors, soldiers, and teachers um, was called Operation Carlotta and it began in 1975. Um, so for the Cubans that went to Angola and went to any other place in Africa, they went in with the understanding that they were going to like a war zone. And this may very well have been a one-way trip, meaning that they might go to Angola, fight side by side with African people and never come back, never see their families again. They did not get paid. They did not ask for anything. They went because they understood that the liberation of Africa is intrinsically connected to the liberation of all of humanity and Cuba's liberation as well. And so with that understanding, they, took, they made that commitment and more than 2,000 Cubans died in the struggle for Angolan independence. However, that struggle was successful. Whoops. Um, so it unquestionably, unquestionably stopped the spread of apartheid in Southern Africa. A really important thing to understand about apartheid in Azania is that the occupying government, the Setter government, did not intend to stay in Azania. The apartheid government in Azania, which is again, the African people's name for South Africa, had the intention of spreading apartheid across the entirety of Southern Africa. They're gonna move beyond Azania's borders into places like Angola, into places like Namibia, into the entirety of South Africa and institute apartheid settler governments on African land. Like that was the plan. That was the plan. And the revolution in Angola supported by Cuba and led by the MPLA is what stopped the spread of apartheid throughout Southern Africa, without question. Had the MPLA not engaged that struggle, had Cuba not shown up to support that struggle, apartheid would have spread across the entirety of Southern Africa, without question. So from 1975 to 1988, the South African apartheid armed forces embarked on a campaign of massive destabilization of the region of Southern Africa. This destabilization was incredibly violent and devastating for African people in that region. Between 1981 and 1988, an estimated 1.5 million African people were killed by these apartheid forces. 1.5 million African people killed by apartheid forces seeking to expand apartheid beyond South Africa. And that number includes 825,000 African children murdered by these settlers. The decisive military confrontation of this um, revolutionary struggle led by the MPLA and supported by Cuba was the Battle of Quito Guanavale. Quito Guanavale. It's a Portuguese name because that place was colonized by the Portuguese. But Quito Guanavale was a small town in um, apartheid South Africa which represented a critical turning point in the struggle against apartheid. From November 1987 to March 1988, the South African apartheid forces repeatedly tried and failed to capture Quito Cornavale, but they could not because Cuban forces, again, led by the MPLA, were there to fight them and to make them back off. And so ultimately those forces, those African forces, supported by the Cuban military, were able to defeat the apartheid forces at Quito Cornavale, and the defeat at Quito Cornavale forced the European settler government of South Africa to negotiate, to bring them to the table to negotiate with revolutionary African organizations. This led directly 
to Namibia getting independence. And once again, it led directly to the stop of the spread of apartheid throughout Southern Africa. I cannot reiterate enough that these European settlers were trying to steal all of the land in Southern Africa, institute apartheid throughout all of Southern Africa, oppress African people on their own land throughout all of Southern Africa. And Cuba stopped that under African leadership. All those hundreds of thousands of Cuba made a one-way trip, stayed there for 15 years, and helped us fight and beat back apartheid. So that's it. Um, and so just to get an idea of like how significant what Cuba helped Africans do was, um, this is a quote from The World, which is an African people's newspaper in Azania. And The World says, Black Africa is riding the crest of a wave generated by the Cuban success in Angola. Black Africa is tasting the heady wine of the possibility of realizing the dream of total liberation. So that is how significant African people in Azania understood what the victory at Quito Carnavale was. Cuba showed up and again, under African leadership, we asked them to come. We asked them to be under our leadership and they were like, yes. So that is how significant their contribution was to the struggle to end apartheid and to the struggle to liberate these nations and peoples of Southern Africa. Um, bonus question. So like I said, the Cuban um, solidarity mission uh, that, that supported the MPLA in Angola was known as Operation Carlotta, started in 1975. So who was that named for? Who is Carlotta? I don't see any comments, so I'll help you out. Cuba named that operation after an enslaved African woman, a Lakumi woman. She was one of three leaders of an uprising against Spanish colonialism and slavery in the Matanzas region of Cuba in 1843. Carlotta, alongside two other women leaders, organized rebellions of enslaved African people in Cuba using talking drums. They used talking drums because they knew that was a way to communicate with the masses of African people on the island that the Spanish would not be able to understand. And so they used those talking drums to organize their people, to coordinate their efforts, and to launch the rebellion. And ultimately, Carlotta, alongside her fellow leaders, was able to lead dozens of uprisings across Cuba um, for a one-year period between 1843 and 1844. Carlotta herself personally led two of those rebellions and she died fighting for her and her people's freedom. So I want to like, just like the fact that Cuba claimed that history, brought it into the present and said, we are going to Africa and we are fighting by your side using the name of this woman that resisted colonialism on this island. Like the United States happily has statues of slaveholders all over the nation. And not only is that accepted, but when people question it, it's a problem. It's like a whole movement in response. You get like European men with guns going out to protect the statue and killing people and shit. But Cuba has a statue of this woman on the island because Cuba understands that the resistance of enslaved African people alongside the resistance of indigenous people laid the groundwork for the Cuban revolution itself. The Cuban revolution point blank would not have happened without the resistance of African people and indigenous people to colonization and to slavery. It would not have happened. And they understand that. They understand the key part that African resistance and indigenous resistance played in their own liberation. Cuba to this day is a majority African country. So Cuba like celebrates the history of African resistance to slavery. Cuba calls back to it and builds upon it. And when Cuba showed up in Africa, they brought that legacy with them. So that is why that mission was called Operation Carlotta. Next, next, next. Excuse me, someone's like, uh, I aming me and it's very distracted. Let me just close this. Sweet, cool. So next example, um, so uh, is Cuba and the Congo. And this example I wanted to bring in because it's actually an example where Cuba showed up when they were called upon, but the national liberation struggle was ultimately not successful. And it's important to understand in like revolutionary liberation work and revolutionary solidarity, the shit does not always work out. We are up against a massively organized and incredibly violent and 
um, anti-human, anti-life enemy that is willing to throw all kinds of obstacles in our way to engage in all kinds of barbaric tactics to sabotage us in many, many, many ways. And that means that victory is not guaranteed. Victory is not certain. And so sometimes, you know, people organize for their liberation. They call it help and that help shows up. They struggle as hard as they can um, to defeat that enemy. And for a variety of reasons, that struggle is not successful. And so the example of the Congo is an example where the national liberation struggle was defeated despite Cuba's support. But it's important to look at the failures and look at why they happened and look at how people who are truly in solidarity respond to those failures. As, it's as important to look at the failures as it is to look at the victories. So without further ado, let's talk about Cuba and Africa, the Congo. So the picture on the slide is Che Guevara holding an African baby next to, I believe that's Victor Drake or it's uh, Pombo. Um, I'm not sure of the, of the Africa on the slide, but I'm pretty sure it's Pombo. So yeah, uh, so after the US government collaborated with Belgium to murder Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, for folks that don't know, Patrice Lumumba was the first man elected president of Ghana or after of Ga the Congo, after the Congo gained independence from Belgium. He gave a rousing speech at the United Nations where he was like, we do not need y'all. We do not want you here. We are going to liberate ourselves. We are going to build our own developed nation. And we want you completely out of here because all you've done is exploit us and we don't and we don't respect you. So he gave a speech like that at the, at the U.N., and Belgium was like, word? And so they went to the United States and they were like, we need this man out of the way. We think he's a communist. He's trying to nationalize these resources. He's trying to make sure the African people in the Congo control their own resources. So let's get rid of this man. And the United States was like, sweet, let's do it. And so they worked together to murder Patrice Lumumba, just like they murdered Thomas Sankara, just like they murdered Morris Bishop, all like, just like they murdered Fred Hampton, just like they murdered Malcolm X. They did the same thing to Patrice Lumumba. And so after Patrice Lumumba was assassinated, it left a massive power vacuum in the Congo in which the masses of African people in the Congo, um, under the leadership of the National Congolese Movement, were struggling to regain control of their land, were struggling to fill that power vacuum to, in order to not allow Belgium to step in and recolonize. So the National Congolese Movement, or the MNC, called out to the world for help. They said, we need support to beat back the forces of imperialism, to beat back the Belgians in the United States. And so Cuba was like, yes, we will go. Cuba sent troops to the Congo to assist the remnants of the MNC, the National Congolese Movement, in their efforts to wage guerrilla warfare against the imperialist back forces of Joseph Mobutu. Che Guevara led that contingent to the Congo. He took on a Kiswahili name, Tatu, which means number two, and he helped train Congolese combatants um, to resist the forces of imperialism. So obviously, you know, Cuba fought an entire successful revolution. And so Cuba had a lot to share in terms of military strategy, in terms of guerrilla warfare strategies. And that's what they did around the world. Um, but unfortunately, for a variety of reasons, it was very, very, very difficult to engage in that training and to engage in the kind of work to build the forces of the MNC that were already fragmented, that were already under heavy attack. So things like unfamiliarity with the terrain, unfamiliarity with like the local language on some levels, um, like problems with coordination, um, as well as, you know, infiltration of the MNC forces alongside like all of that on top of like a continuous onslaught from imperialist powers that are struggling for control of the Congo prevented the people's forces and Cuban forces in the Congo from being successful in their efforts to beat back imperialism. So after a long struggle to try to kind of work this out, Cuba ultimately made the decision to withdraw. They said, this is not going to work. Um, the MNC forces were overrun. Um, there was too much like treachery from some of the, Co the Congolese people that work with the Belgians to murder Patrice Lumumba and contest for power. And so it just wasn't a situation where Cuba felt it could be successful. And even then, like some of the Congolese people were like, while you're here, you don't even, you don't understand what we're trying to do. You don't understand us. And so, yeah, so Cuba ultimately was like, we, this is, we can't, we're not sure what we can do in this situation. Um, we have to withdraw. And so many of the Cuban forces returned to Cuba, but Che Guevara himself stayed in Africa. Che Guevara himself uh, traveled to Tanzania, which at that time was under the leadership of Julius Inere. It was like a liberated zone. 
And he stayed in the Cuban embassy in Tanzania for several months, for like a summer. I actually like went, so I've been to Tanzania um, with the Offering People's Revolutionary Party. And I went to the Cuban embassy and I saw where Che Guevara stayed, this very small, hot room. One thing about the Cuban, this is like a tangent, but one thing about the Cuban embassy in Tanzania and also the Cuban embassy in, the, in Ghana is that you can just like walk right in. Like we didn't have an appointment. We weren't like official people. We were just like people, members of the Offering People's Revolutionary Party. And we were like, can we speak to the ambassador? And the African lady at the desk was like, yeah. And he just like met us and we like got to walk around and he like gave us a tour and like told us about Che. Meanwhile, the American embassy, the U.S. embassy was like up the street. And not only was it not like a walk in kind of situation, but it was like surrounded by like a 20 foot high wall topped with barbed wire. There was all kinds of like visibly armed guards, like with assault rifles standing outside. Um, it was not a situation where we could be like, oh, we're in a revolution organization. Can we talk to the ambassador? Like It wasn't going to happen. And the reason for that. The reason why Cuba's embassy was like a walk-in situation and the U.S. embassy was like a heavily fortified situation is because Cuba has like nothing to fear from African people. Cuba should have showed up for African people in like a principled and consistent way. And so no one's going to try to attack a Cuban embassy in Africa because Cuba helps Africa. Cuba doesn't exploit Africa. Cuba doesn't colonize Africa. But the U.S. exploits Africa, loots Africa, exploits African people, is currently through the through the AFRICOM program drone bombing Africa. And so the US embassy has to be fortified because if it wasn't, African people would burn that shit down. So I just wanna contrast that, a little bit of a tangent. But anyway, so after the, the mission in the Congo failed, Che Guevara traveled to Tanzania, stayed in the Cuban embassy for a few months, but he wasn't just chillaxing. After the mission in the Congo failed, he was like, how do we make sure this never happens again? How do we build deep enough relationships and trust-based relationships with African liberation struggles where when we show up, there is no miscommunication. There is no struggle to relate to each other. We are on the same page and understand exactly what is needed of us. And so the way that he did that was that he used the Tanzanian embassy of his, as his base of operations. And they traveled throughout Africa to meet with other revolutionary African liberation organizations. He went to Guinea-Bissau. And he built a relationship with the PIGC, the African Party for the Independence of Guinea-Bissau. He went to Angola and he built a relationship with the MPLA, the Popular Movement for the Liberation of Angola. He went to Mo Mozambique and built with the Mozambique Liberation Front. He went to Namibia and he built with the Southwest African People's Organization, SWAPO. He went to Azania and he built relationships with the African National Congress, the ANC, the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, the PAC, the Azanian People's Organization, Azapo, and the Black Consciousness Movement. So even though the mission in the Congo failed, Che was like, how can we build relationships in Africa so that when Africa calls, we can show up in a principled way. And he went to all of these nations and he built with the revolutionary struggles there. And then he went back to Cuba and he helped them develop that relationship too. And that meant when those movements called upon the Cuban people, the Cuban revolution to support national liberation struggles, Cuba was able to show up in a way that had a foundation of a trust-based relationship. They weren't just trying to like swoop in and be like, we're gonna save you. They were trying to be like, what are you trying to do? Who are you? How can we help? What is needed from us? They built an understanding of our struggle before they tried to show up to help us. They built trust-based relationships with us before they said they were in solidarity with us. That's like such a departure from the way that people understand solidarity under capitalism. Like so many people, so many people will be like, Black Lives Matter. I'm in solidarity with African liberation. Blah, 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 blah. They'll say all that kind of shit, but then when you talk to them or when you see what they support, it's like, obvious they have no concept whatsoever of what we're even trying to do like they have no concept of why we're oppressed at all and they have no concept of the work that we have done to resist that oppression at all they'll maybe know like uh martin luther king they might know malcolm x if they saw the movie but they could not tell you what emma k's politics were or what malcolm x's politics were beyond like a platitude and if you ask them, like, 
about any other kind of revolutionary African liberation movement, about the difference between anti-colonialism and anti-racism, about the strategies that our people have used to resist oppression on this land and throughout the world, they could not tell you. They couldn't tell you. And to me, like, I don't understand how someone could be like, I'm in solidarity with you and not even on like a basic level understand what you're even trying to do. Like, what kind of solidarity is that? Like, if you have no idea what, how, like, why I'm oppressed and how I'm trying to, like, how I'm trying to fight that oppression, then what are you in solidarity with? What? What? Anyway. So Cuba moved very, very differently. Cuba worked to build, like, intentional relationships. And that's part of the reason why Cuba showed up in the way they did and why that showing up was so successful and so impactful for Africa. So last, last example is Cuba in Africa, Guinea-Bissau. And the picture on the slide is two of the men that I respect most on the planet. It is Emmanuel Cabral, who is the African on the left, who is one of the founders of the PIGC. And on the right is Fidel Castro, one of the leaders of the Cuban Revolution, the longtime president of Cuba, one of the most principled, like these are two of the most principled men and most principled revolutionaries that have ever existed in the history of the planet. And they are lied upon constantly. Like, well, they don't, we don't, people typically like, people just like don't talk about Amicac Cabral outside of the African liberation struggle, even though he was brilliant, even though he came, created like so much theory that is essential for building revolution in this particular moment. Like people usually don't talk about him. And Fidel Castro just gets lied on, on a pretty much a constant basis. So these are two men that are drastically misrepresented that I deeply respect, that made massive contributions to the uh, struggle to liberate Africa and the struggle to liberate humanity. So shout out to them, much love to them. But in Guinea-Bissau, Cuba provided medicine, food, and war materials to the PIGC for 10 years. So once again, these are not like fly by night kind of missions. These are like long-term engagements with solidarity. It's not like show up for a march one time and be like, you're welcome. It's like, how do we show up in, for the long haul to support your struggle to liberate yourselves? So for 10 years, Cuba was in Guinea-Bissau assisting, assisting the PIGC in the struggle uh, against Portuguese colonialism. From 1964 to 1974, until the PIGC won independence, Cuban doctors, nurses, and soldiers went to Guinea-Bissau and fought side by side with the PIGC. For the PIGC, it was essential that the Africans be the primary agents of the national liberation struggle. Thus, while Cuban fighters were accepted in the liberation war, they were only placed in units where the PIGC lacked skills and manpower, such as in artillery units. So that is like really, really, really important. I'm gonna repeat that one more time, actually. For the PIGC, it was essential that Africans be the primary agents of our liberation struggle. They said, Cuba, we would like your support, but Cuba, we're gonna put you where we need you and we are running this shit. And Cuba was like, dope, let's do it. And that is once again, a massive departure from the paternalistic and racist as hell way that the African liberation struggle is typically engaged. I can't even tell you how many Europeans I have met in like the Black Lives Matter movement, like in the streets saying like, you know, I can't breathe, that believe they have some right to leadership and direction within our struggle. Particularly like um, the folks I call like cracker communists, right? They're like, these Africans are not capable of having ideological leadership within their own struggle. We know what's best for how to liberate African people. We have the theory. We have the strategy. Despite the fact that these people have never led a single revolution, they're like, we know better than you about what your liberation looks like. And so we are going to show up and we are going to try to direct your shit. We're going to like lead your marches. We're going to tell you what to read. We're going to shit on your heroes because we know better than you about how to liberate yourselves. That's how people show up. I remember... When I was living in Portland, Oregon, that's where I joined the African People's Revolutionary Party. Portland, Oregon is the, is the whitest major U.S. city. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's very deep and all-encompassing whiteness in that place. But I remember when um, I was living there when the Black Lives Matter movement popped off, or rather the movement for black lives, when the Ferguson uprising happened and there were massive, uh, you know, uprisings and, and mobilizations around the entire country. Um, 
protesting what had been done to this African and like the larger trend of police terrorism against African people. And I remember in those marches, uh, a certain element of European people that were trying to tell us how we need to do that shit. That even attempted to engage the All African People's Revolutionary Party and like have us like move with their direction. Like they thought they were gonna come in and like influence how we moved. And then we would be like in these like marches as their like fucking Cracker Manchurian candidate. Um, and do what we want them to do and like move the, the movement in, in what how they want it to be moved. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen <laughs> because that's something it's not something you can do with the APRP. But it's just an example of how like arrogant and paternalistic and racist uh, a lot of people who are out there chanting Black Lives Matter like actually are. Like y'all don't show up and defer to our leadership. Y'all show up and you're like, this is what I think needs to be happening and make moves to make that happen. And then when we're like, stop. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, let us fucking liberate ourselves. You're just like, identity politics. Or I shouldn't have to do that. Or blah, blah, blah. It's just very frustrating. But what I am extremely grateful for is that this example exists. This example of solidarity that was actually successful. Because once again, the PIGC liberated Guinea-Bissau and defeated Portuguese colonialism. So the way that Cuba showed up in this case, where they deferred to the leadership of African people was effective that struggle was won and it wasn't just in guinea bissau it was also in angola it was also in mozambique it was also in Zania. it was throughout the african world so clearly the model of like we y'all y'all darkies don't know what you're doing let us let us lead you does not fucking work these are people the people saying this have never ever ever like ever had a successful revolution but the model of we will defer to your leadership tell us where we are needed and we will show up clearly works so that proof is in the pudding but anyway so the PIGC's plan for the start of the struggle in the islands of Cabo Verde and also in Guinea-Bissau was actually to replicate Castro's 1956 landing in the Grandma Yacht in Cuba the PIGC fought a guerrilla struggle where they organized the masses of African people like millions of African people around the objective of fighting Portuguese colonialism and chasing it out of their country and they won. They won. They won. They defeated Portuguese colonialism. And that victory happened after imperialism assassinated Amical Cabral. So Amical Cabral was one of the founders of the PIGC. He was like the ideological father of that movement. He laid the groundwork for that movement. But what the PIGC did was they did not put leadership just in like a sole person. They worked to create thousands and thousands and thousands of leaders within this anti-colonial struggle. And what that meant was that when Amical Kerbal was assassinated, that shit just kept moving. It kept going forward. Because they didn't, like, he was very, very important, but he was not needed for victory because they had worked to create all of these leaders. And so when Amical Cabral was killed, the people still knew what the plan was and how to move forward and how to respond and how to fight back. And so even though Amical Cabral was assassinated by the forces of imperialism for the crime, the crime of wanting to liberate his people, the struggle against Portuguese colonialism in Guinea-Bissau with the support of the Cubans was successful. The Portuguese were successfully chased out of Guinea-Bissau. And not only was Guinea-Bissau liberated, but the blowback from that victory led to the fall of fascism in Portugal. You're welcome, Portugal. It was the resistance of African people demoralizing Portuguese troops, demoralizing Portuguese power that led to the fall of the dictatorship, the fascist dictatorship in Portugal. If you don't believe me, Google that shit. But we did that. You're welcome. Anyway. So yeah, Portugal's liberation from its own dictatorial regime was one of the first results of the anti-colonial wars that took place in Africa. Not only did the masses of people in Guinea-Bissau, with Cuban support, liberate themselves, but they also liberated a European country from fascism. And you're going to tell us that you know what's best for our struggle? When have you ever done anything like that? Never. Never. Why don't you go organize your people to be less reactionary and racist as fuck instead of trying to tell us what we need to do? How about that? Tell them to stop fucking voting for Trump. Jesus. Anyway. So, that's the example of getting this out. Actually, let me drink something because uh, I have like a dry mouth. Let me give myself a break. That's really good. Jesus. Okay. Excuse me. I don't take the Lord's name in vain or your Lord's name in vain. 
So this is the last slide. And I want to bring out the principles that were illustrated by these examples of how Cuba moved in Africa and how Cuba showed up for African liberation. First and foremost, Cuba showed up with the understanding that they were equals and not saviors. At no point did Cuba ever swoop in and say, we got this, let us do it. We know better than you. Cuba showed up and they were like, where are we needed? How can we support? Put us where you need us. And they listened and they listened because they understood that any oppressed and colonized people cannot be rescued from that situation by anyone. That's just not going to happen. You as a European person or you as a person living outside the nation that has been colonized do not have the capacity to save them from anything. Get that shit the hell out of your head. It's not happening. The only people that can liberate an oppressed or colonized nation is the people of that nation themselves. The way that U.S. imperialism works in the 21st century, the way that they're able to justify going to all of these nations and droning and invading and looting is through this, 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 this farce of humanitarian intervention. The U.S. empire, despite being, despite being the most violent force on the face of the planet, the single greatest obstacle to justice for all of humanity has created this fucking lie that they only exist to save other nations. And yet when that humanitarian intervention happens in places like Honduras, in places like Libya, in places like Haiti, in place after place after place, all that ever happens when the United States goes to help is that people are murdered in Libya, people are enslaved, states are destroyed, chaos reigns. They're saying we're here to help, and in the aftermath of that help, it's nothing but thousands of corpses in like scorched, scorched earth, earth. But the people of the United States, like the so-called progressives, the liberals, are like, we have a responsibility to help the rest of the planet. Who else will show up if not for us? Blah, blah, blah. All this kind of shit. Like, you should have lied to yourselves. The United States does not do any kind of military or political intervention for uh, good reasons, for like helpful reasons. The only reason why the United States does that shit is to fucking loot and steal and murder. That's always been the case. And the reason why people accept that shit, the reason why people accept that obvious lie in the United States is because they have internalized the lie of the white savior. The United States presents itself as a white savior on the global stage and people have internalized the belief that it has actually a legitimate thing to do, that people can be saved from these conditions. But colonialism has never fallen ever anywhere by a colonizing power, by an imperialist power being like, boom, here's your freedom. That's not how it works. The colonized people must organize and fight back and wage a revolutionary struggle to liberate themselves. That is the only way it has ever been successful. There is no motherfucking such thing as a white savior. It has always been a racist, imperialist construction, a lie. And that is why it is extremely important, a principle to uphold the part of revolutionary solidarity is to show up as an equal, not a savior, to defer to the leadership of the oppressed people to liberate themselves. You do not know better than us about how we can liberate ourselves. You know nothing. I guarantee, like, man, the people that just, I'm getting very irritated. <laughs> but, like, the people who are like, Black Lives Matter, this is what you need to do, read this, blah, blah, blah. Like, I guarantee you, those people have never read a book about Africa. They don't know any of the shit I'm talking about. They couldn't name a revolutionary African liberation organization. They could not name the strategies that we have tried for African liberation, but they're telling us they know better despite knowing nothing. So equals not saviors. Next, another principle of revolutionary solidarity, a principle illustrated by how Cuba showed up for Africa is the question of showing up when you're asked. Not just being like, hey, I'm here. Tell me what to do. But waiting when we fucking call about you, call upon you to show up. And then when you do show up, giving only what's asked for. 
only what's asked for, especially when it comes to criticism and thoughts about how we need to move. Especially when it comes to criticisms and thoughts about how we need to move. If you are showing up in solidarity with the struggle for liberation of the colonized people, and they have not asked for your opinion on what they need to do or how they're moving, then you need to shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. No one fucking asked you. You do not know better than us. If we said we need 10,000 masks or we need so many gallons of water to distribute to our people and you're like, maybe you should get milk. Bitch, no one asked you. No one asked you. We are the experts on how to liberate ourselves. We have been engaged in this struggle for centuries. You don't know better than us than what, about what's needed in this particular moment. And even if you think we're moving incorrectly, if we didn't ask you, it's not your business. It's not your business. It's not your business. With, again, again, the struggle to liberate an oppressed and a colonized people, it has to be led by that people themselves. That is the whole point. Colonization is the process of subjugating us to someone else's direction, someone else's culture, someone else's leadership. The entire structure of colonization is about control and keeping us out of control of our own lives. So how could you resist that force it's about controlling us by attempting to control us yourself, by attempting to direct our struggle yourself. You can't, you can't. Like I already said, y'all very often have no idea whatsoever what we're even trying to do. So by what, could you, by what basis could you even give an educated opinion on what we're doing? Especially if no one asked you, like my God. So that's like a repeating thing, right? In the way that Cuba showed up. And it wasn't on the slide, um, but so I, I mentioned Maurice Bishop, who was a revolutionary leader in Grenada, a Caribbean, uh, a, a Caribbean nation, who was assassinated uh, by forces backed by the U.S. government. But Cuba was in Grenada, assisting the revolution, assisting the masses of African people there, right? When Cuba was in Grenada, they peeped contradictions that were a threat to the revolutionary movement there. But they had been asked to be in Grenada to help build an airport and to build infrastructure um, under the leadership of the revolutionary forces. And so though Cuba peeped those contradictions and though Cuba was like, man, I don't know if the house is gonna go, because they were not asked to present that opinion, because they were not given alternate direction about how to move, Cuba was like, we're gonna do what's asked of us, we're gonna show up uh, in the way that's asked of us, but we're not gonna oppose our opinion about what needs to happen here. And they didn't, and they didn't. That is something that particularly like European people, but like non-African people in general struggle with when it comes to relating to African people. And the reason for that is because people don't like respect us on a basic level. People do not believe that we have the capacity to liberate ourselves. People do not believe that we have the capacity to build revolutionary anti-colonial movements that would be successful. Even though we have, in place after place after place, we have done that on a mass basis, the scale of which few other people know. But people don't trust that we can lead our own struggle. And that's why people show up in our spaces and try to tell us how we need to move and try to give us criticisms unsolicited and try to, and try to direct how our liberation struggle should go because they don't actually think we can do it. But the fact of the matter is we can, the fact of the matter is we have. And if you want to maintain a trust-based and principled relationship with our struggle, then you must respect our leadership. Respect our leadership, respect our leadership. If you are not asked for your opinions about how we are moving, Keep your mouth shut, especially if you're like a European seller in the United States, like you have so much more to do, so much more to worry about than telling us how we need to move. Like, do you understand that the forces, like the masses of European people in the United States are like a proto-fascist force are like going to unite behind a fascist government, are going to act as like vigilante armed forces to attack colonized people? Like you're already doing that. Like, y'all got problems. And I guarantee you're, like, blood related to some people doing that shit. Like, you have issues that must be organized around to address them. So why are you worried about what we're doing? Why are you trying to tell us what to do when you can't even have a direct conversation with your racist-ass relative that's voting for Trump? You know what I'm saying? Like, worry about yourself. Don't give 
unsolicited criticisms, thoughts, or direction, if we didn't ask you, shut your mouth. Respect our leadership. Another principle of revolutionary solidarity is a deep understanding of the struggle you're showing up in solidarity with. And I would argue that this is like the foundation of everything. The foundation of everything when it comes to the question of solidarity. There is no way whatsoever that you could be said to be in solidarity with a movement, with a struggle, with the people, if you don't even understand what that movement or struggle is. Huh, okay, example. Um, so this week, it was announced that Killer Mike of Run the Jewels, uh, an, a hip-hop artist, uh, was opening a bank, the Greenwood Bank. And the reason why he has done this is because thanks to the counter-revolutionary strategy of disseminating the tactic of black capitalism within the African liberation movement, many of our people are under the impression that the way that we can liberate ourselves in this context is by building our own form of capitalism, by building our own institutions within capitalism. That is a doomed strategy that is not going to work. The entire concept of black capitalism was first introduced on a mass basis by the Nixon government. The, like, the government under the Republican President Nixon was the first entity to disseminate the strategy of black capitalism and black banks and black owned businesses as a way to liberate African people. It was fucking Nixon, dog. It was Nixon. So out the gate, like Nixon is not going to have a strategy for African liberation that's going to be successful. But if you don't believe me, if you want a deeper analysis of what I'm talking about, check out the work of Jared Ball. Uh, with I Mix What I Like, he has gone into very, very deep detail, done a quite amount of research to expose why the concept of black capitalism um, and black banks and black buying power are all bullshit. So Google that if you need to. But fact of the matter is, um, it was a Nixon government uh, trying to figure out how to undermine revolutionary African organizations that first introduced the idea of black capitalism on a mass basis to African people. And we internalized that. Unfortunately, it was very successful, that strategy. And so Killer Mike's bank is an example of that success. And so Killer Mike announced that stupid ass bank. And um, yeah, because people have no understanding whatsoever of why African people are oppressed within this specific system of capitalism, I saw so-called allies talking about, yeah, black bank, killer Mike, woo! Like, so when African people are like, we need black capitalism, I have like an extraordinary amount of patience, right? Because like I just said, it was like a counter-revolutionary strategy that was intentionally introduced to undermine our anti-colonial struggle. Like they did that on purpose to misdirect us. And so we were targeted with all kinds of propaganda for decades to institutionalize this belief within our people. So when African people are like, a black owned bank is gonna save us, I have patience because it's my job as a revolutionary to help them unlearn, to help them realize that that's just not gonna work, it's my work. But when an ally, like specifically a European, but any kind of non-African ally, is like sweet black owned bank, like this is how we're gonna do it, like I get so annoyed, like so irritated because what that shows is that y'all are doing like hashtag black lives matter Y'all are saying you're in solidarity with us. Y'all are saying you're showing up for us. But you have no idea whatsoever why we're oppressed or what we're trying to do. Like, you have no idea. You're celebrating Killer Mike because it's an African person talking about liberation in, like, vague-ass terms. And you're like, that sounds good to me. Because you haven't done any reading or studying about our struggle. If you had, you would have recognized that as bullshit immediately. So on what, in what way could you be said to be actually in solidarity with us if you don't even understand what we're trying to do? That's what I'm saying, man. Like, so many examples like that where, you know, like DeRay or like Sean King, like for years, for years, people have been trying to explain to people and shit, and Europeans are still like, solidarity with DeRay, <laughs> sharing Sean King articles. Because y'all don't listen to us and you don't read. You say you're in solidarity, but you don't even bother to learn about what we're trying to do. So yeah. In order to be in solidarity with the struggle for liberation, in solidarity with the struggle against oppression, you have to understand what that struggle actually is. You have to understand what the struggle actually is. If you have not read a single book about African liberation, about the history of our struggle, you are not in solidarity with shit. If you have not read a single book 
about why African people are in the condition that we are in. And I do not mean that you read the case of reparations in the Atlantic and now you think you understand anything. That is not what I mean. If you have never actually studied the question of African oppression and African liberation, you cannot be in solidarity with the struggle because you don't even understand what we're trying to do. You don't even understand why we're oppressed. So in what way could you ever be in solidarity if you don't even understand what the objective is? The prerequisite to being in true revolutionary solidarity with a movement for liberation is understanding what that movement is actually trying to do. Is it actually trying to do? And if y'all actually did that work, if y'all engaged in study about the struggles that you claim to be in solidarity with, you could not be led around by the nose by these straight up opportunist Africans and misleaders. You would not be able to be manipulated in that way if you engage in that kind of study, if you engage in that kind of learning. And even if you don't want to read, because for whatever reason, reading is very unpopular at this time in history, all, all like the all African People's Revolutionary Party is constantly, constantly, constantly producing political education about our struggle that is available for anyone to watch. We do that shit constantly. We do the show every week. We have seminars both in the New Mexico chapter and like in the global APRP. We are constantly producing writing on platforms like Hood Communist. We are constantly producing, you know, streams across multiple organizations. Like we are constantly talking about our struggle, educating people about our struggle, putting our analysis into the world. And so even if you didn't read, you could still just fucking listen to us. And you would have a better understanding of what we're trying to do. But you can't even do that. You can't even do that. And that's why when Killer Mike opens a bank, all these confused ass people, all these so-called allies are like, yes, this will help because you have no idea. You have no idea what we're trying to do. It's not enough to just have good intentions and be like, I'm helping. You have to understand what is actually needed of you before you can say you're in uh, solidarity with us. So, blah, 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 blah. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes. Let me see. Oh yeah, so those are the principles of revolutionary solidarity embodied by how Cuba showed up in Africa. Once again, showing up as equals and not saviors. Showing up when called upon only. And then when you're called upon and you show up, giving only what's asked for, deferring to the leadership of the people you're in solidarity with, only offering criticisms, thoughts, and on how to move when we ask for that shit. If we don't trust you, if you don't ask, then just close your mouth, close your mouth. That's it. And then also, the last principle, the most important principle, is having a deep understanding of the struggle that you're aiding. And I can say not only is this true um, for European and non-African people engaging the African liberation struggle, it's also true for African people or African organizations moving in solidarity with other colonized peoples. For example, here in New Mexico, and actually anywhere where the, where the APRP exists, we work intentionally to build ties with indigenous organizations, with Chicano organizations, with Palestinian and Filipino organizations, and any organization of oppressed and colonized people that is fighting against imperialism, that is fighting against colonialism and capitalism, we work to build an intentional relationship with. And the way that we do that is that we build relationships built on trust. We build relationships built on reciprocity. And we build relationships built on an understanding that we must develop our analysis of what these colonized struggles are attempting to achieve before we can show up in any kind of meaningful solidarity. Here in New Mexico, we just met with the Brown Berets and La Raza Unida and Pueblo Action Alliance. And we had a meeting where we discussed how we can build deep relationships with each other, how we can show up in solidarity with each other. We left that meeting saying we're going to host a teach-in where each organization is gonna educate the other ones about what they believe, about what they're trying to do, about how those organizations can show up for them. We are intentional about how we build relationships with other struggles because we understand, one, that we are fighting the same enemy all around the world, the same folks that stole the T1 Nation's land, the same folks that colonized Palestine and are attempting to wipe that people off the map, are the same people that instituted apartheid in Southern Africa, that stole land in, uh, in Algeria, that murdered Patrice Lumumba and Thomas Sankara and Amakal Cabral, that overthrew the government of Kwame Nkrumah, that are oppressing African people all over the world. It is the same people giving colonized nations hell 
all around the world. And that means that we are engaging in the same fight on many, many different fronts. And so our primary focus is the liberation of Africa and African people. We are focused on that. We are focused on Africa because we understand when Africa is free, African people everywhere will be free. But we also understand because it's just one front in a larger struggle against imperialism, in a larger struggle against capitalism, at the struggle against the, the Zionist occupation of Palestine, the struggle against the British occupation of Ireland, the struggle against the U.S. empire occupying Tiwa territory and occupying Turtle Island is the same fight that we are engaged in. So our struggle to liberate Africa frees ourselves. But our struggle to liberate Africa also contributes to the global struggle to liberate humanity. And a victory in Palestine is a victory for that same global struggle. A victory in Turtle Island is a victory for that same global struggle. And so we have not just like a, like a, a moral based um, imperative to assist those struggles, but also a pragmatic imperative to assist those struggles. Because a victory for colonized people anywhere against imperialism is a victory for all of us. And so we have a responsibility to support those struggles while we engage our own, to show up in solidarity with those struggles while we wage our own. And the way that we do that is by developing an understanding of what they're even trying to do, what they're even trying to do. Showing up as equals and not saviors, showing up when called upon and only giving what's asked for, and also developing that deep analysis, that deep understanding of what they are trying to achieve, what their objectives of liberation are. So, yep. Um, oh, yeah. The other thing I want to end with, this particular section, and then I'm going to like sprint through the COVID updates and the Africa updates and the um, local organizing updates, because I'm actually supposed to be at work right now, whoopsie daisy. But the last thing I want to end with um, is just like an understanding that Cuba itself is a majority African nation. Like I already mentioned previously, um, the Cuban revolution um, that overthrew capitalism, overthrew US imperialism would not have been possible without the resistance of African and indigenous people on that island. The resistance of African people to slavery and the resistance of indigenous people to land theft. And to this day, like, I've been to Cuba one time. As soon as I stepped off the plane, I was like, wow, there's like a lot of Africans. And that impression continued for the entire trip. I was there for two weeks. It is extremely apparent when you are in Cuba that the majority of that population is of African descent. The majority of that population is African. And so when we talk about um, Cuba and Africa, they were showing up in solidarity, but they were also showing up for their own people. And to illustrate that, I'm going to read a quote from Fidel Castro, where he shows like a very, very clear understanding of the significance of that. So, as a result of four centuries of cruel slave trade, almost 1,300,000 Africans came to our island. Their strong presence marked forever the history of our nation. The dark bellies of slave ships brought to Cuba men, women, and children of more than 200 ethnic groups from ancient African cultures. They brought to our homeland African customs, tastes, beliefs, and traditions, forever marking the essence of our culture and contributing decisively to the formation of Cuban nationality. So in that quote, they are uplifting not just the massive African population that existed in Cuba at the time of colonization and that exists to this day, but they are also uplifting the massive influence that Africa and African culture had on the development of the Cuban identity, of the Cuban national identity. Amical Carbal once called Cuba an African nation. And it's because of the large African population, but also the unquestionable influence of African resistance and African culture on the development of the Cuban identity. And then another quote from Fidel Castro, which is a really, really good way to end this presentation is that the fulfillment of solidarity obligations is not a virtue it is a duty so they're not showing up in solidarity with africa because they want to feel good about themselves they're not showing up in solidarity with african with with africa and african liberation because it's important to their personal conception of themselves they're showing up for Africa and African liberation because they understand that the liberation of Africa is tied to the liberation of all life on earth. They're not doing it out of charity. They're not doing it to save us. They're doing it because they know that the liberation of life on this planet requires the liberation of Africa and African people. It is as much for themselves as much as it is for us. It is as much for the rest of humanity as it is for Africa. So 
That was Revolutionary Solidarity, using the example of the Cuban Revolution. If you have any thoughts about this presentation, any questions or comments, definitely drop them in the chat, in the comments on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitter. And then I'm going to switch back to the big video of myself, and you're, I'm going to disappear for a second. One second. Hello, I'm back. So, thank you all so much. Thanks for everybody that tuned in. Thanks for your comments. I'm just like looking through. I see like a lot of write on, dope, love it, teach. Yeah, fucking A, girl. <laughs> I appreciate these comments. I'm glad that y'all got something from that presentation. Thank y'all so much for la um, watching and for laughing and for learning. I appreciate y'all very, very, very much. Um, just to move on to the rest of the show so I can wrap this up in about 15 minutes because I got stuff to do at work. <laughs> There's like a lot of, um, I'd be doing AFIP work on the clock on a consistent basis. And I'm going to do that for as long as possible until I get caught. So shout out for lack of supervision at day jobs. Anywho, so what's going on in the world when it comes to African people? First and foremost, in Nigeria, there is a massive mobilization of the masses of African people there to end SARS. SARS is a paramilitary police force that is responsible for rapes and violence and all kinds of anti-human activity in the name of justice in Nigeria. Not unlike how the police engage African people in the United States. And so these mobilizations have been happening for a couple of weeks. They have been elevated by um, celebrities and people throughout the diaspora on social media. We are now seeing Africans throughout the United States and the diaspora showing up in solidarity for Nigerian people by uplifting the struggle to end SARS. Um, really, really exciting development was when um, the EFF in Ghana, the Economic Freedom Fighters, not related to the EFF in Azania, um, released a statement and mobilized an action in solidarity with Nigeria as Pan-Africanism in action. So this movement has been unfolding for the past couple of weeks. And in response, the Nigerian government said, okay, 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 all right, we heard you. We're gonna end SARS. We're gonna we're gonna dissolve SARS. And I saw at first like a lot of people like celebrating that in the United States, in the United States. So I saw um, Africans in the United States being like, "Woo, they did it! They're dissolving SARS." Much like what happened when at first Minneapolis was like, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna abolish the police, right?" Um, so Nigerian government, the neocolonial government in Nigeria, announced they were end dissolving SARS. But I don't think a lot of folks read beyond the headline that said they were dissolving SARS because if you've read the articles, you actually saw that they said we're going to dissolve SARS and they're going to move, we're going to move the resources for SARS into another program to address crime. That was like, that was like in the initial announcement, the initial press conference where they announced they were dissolving SARS. Um, they said that we were going to create something else that they like laid a shut up. But despite that, um, I saw African people in the United States. Um, black nationalists, Pan-Africanists being like, we did it! Or like, they did it! Woo! Success! And then, of course, this week, this week, the Nigerian government announced that they are forming a SWAT team. Yes, that SWAT team. They are moving the forces that were previously a part of SARS into this new SWAT team. And the purpose of the SWAT team is precisely that of SARS. To fight crime, to fight crime through overwhelming violence using military weapons. So they saw the mass mobilization of the people. The mobilization of the people pressured the neocolonial Nigerian government to respond in a way. And how they responded was essentially by just like rebranding and shuffling around employees. This is like a really important lesson for any struggle against police terrorism, particularly in the United States, where there is a growing demand to abolish the police or to defund the police. It's very, very, very important to understand that capitalism adapts. Capitalism will act like it's giving you what you what you want. Capitalism will be like, oh, word, we heard you. We heard you. Don't worry. And then all capitalism will do is like move some shit around. Just move some shit around. Give it a different name and be like, isn't this what you wanted? That is precisely what happened in Minneapolis when they said we are taking police out of schools. They, the city council voted. And everybody was like, yeah, we did that. And then a few weeks later, people in Minneapolis saw a want ad in the paper where they were hiring private armed security guards that had, man, that had like the experience required was having like, having been a police officer. So they went from agents of the state, armed agents of the state in schools in Minneapolis to now a private security force 
comprised of people that used to be armed agents of the state in Minneapolis. And they're saying, we abolish the police in Minneapolis schools. Capitalism adapts. Neocolonialism adapts. There's absolutely no way that abolishing the police is going to happen while capitalism exists. Any movement for abolition that does not go after capitalism as like the fundamental problem is only going to be misdirected. They're going to pretend they gave you what you want and behind your back, they're going to be rebranding and moving shit around and coming back even stronger to attack you. So very, very important to follow, you know, how movements against police terrorism are developing throughout the diaspora. We have to like cut, like break down this false dichotomy between domestic and international struggles and begin to make the connections, not just in what those struggles look like, but also in how the enemy responds to them. Because in place after place after place, we see like the same strategies deployed. And if we begin to recognize them, if we begin to make these connections, they're not gonna work anymore. We're gonna be able to respond to them in a way that's effective. We're not gonna be caught slipping. But until that happens, they're gonna be able to just reconfigure that shit, rebrand that shit and play in our faces. So please, please, please break down that false dichotomy between domestic and international struggles against police terrorism. Please begin to make those connections between the conditions of African people here in the United States and the condition of African people throughout Africa and the Caribbean, Central and South America. Begin to see the similarities in how the enemy responds. Begin to see the similarities in the conditions so we can take our struggle to the next level and actually win this shit. Other things that are happening, um, you may not know this, but Africa is in a pretty constant state of resistance to imperialism and to colonialism and to capitalism. We don't hear about it in the news here because the United States government has a vested interest in presenting the image that Africa is just like helpless. Africa is like incapable of liberating itself. Africa needs the intervention of the United States and Europe and the UN um, in order to see justice. The United States is very, very, very interested in propagating that lie. And so that's what we hear about Africa. But the reality of the situation is that Africa is in an almost continuous state of uprising to the forces of colonialism, to the forces of imperialism, to the forces of capitalism. And one example of that is that the women in Namibia in Southern Africa have organized massive mobilizations against femicide in that nation. Femicide is one of the most violent consequences of capitalism, one of those violent consequences of colonialism. A strategy of those structures is to deliberately attack women, non-men, and children in order to undermine an entire colonized people, in order to weaken a nation structurally. They create these, these, this process or like this institution of femicide that targets women and non-men, that keeps us at the bottom of society, that keeps us separated um, from our brothers, from men, um, in order to weaken the entire nation. So that is what the purpose, like the political purpose of femicide is as a strategy. And you can actually see um, if you research or study the way that, you know, powers like the United States, powers like Britain and Spain colonized the Western Hemisphere and colonized Africa, you can see in place after place after place, they went for the women and the non-men and the kids. That was an intentional strategy of war that they did not just during colonization, you know, in the, in the 15th and 16th hundreds, but they also did in military intervention after military intervention in the 20th century and in the 21st century. If you look at how the U.S. invasion and occupation of Haiti unfolded, if you look at how the U.S. invasion and occupation of the Philippines unfolded, if you look at how um, the, the European invasions of African nations unfolded, like in Algeria, like in Namibia, like in Azania, you see in place after place after place this intentional strategy of going after women and children and non-men. And they taught through the forces of neocolonialism, through colonization, they taught us how to do that to ourselves. And so now what femicide looks like is unfortunately African men engaging in acts of violence internally against African women, non-men and children. We see lots and lots of lateral violence. We were taught that by the same powers that use that strategy to conquer us, to colonize us. And so the woman in Namibia, Namibia ah, excuse me, the woman in Namibia are organizing and mobilizing to resist this strategy of colonization. They are rising up and they are saying no more. They are rising up and they are saying we will be free. We will fight for our liberation. We will not accept this violence within our community. We have a right to exist safely. And so solidarity with those women and solidarity with all African people all over the continent rising up and fighting back. So that's what's going on very, very briefly in the African world. Moving on quickly to COVID updates. Here in New Mexico, we are experiencing a huge spike. 
of COVID-19. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have, although the numbers have been, as I discussed before on the show, like artificially kept low, despite those efforts, we have been on the lower end of the scale when it comes to new positive infections from this virus. A major part of that was like the size, like the, the population size of, uh, of, of New Mexico. It's like a pretty small state. And so that's, so we benefited from that. But now, now we're in our spike. Um, these past few days have seen broken records for new positive COVID infections in this state. Like each day, there's like a new record high. I think it's like 587 as of yesterday. New infections. And that's like the highest ever that's been seen in New Mexico. Um, it's still a pandemic. Uh, there is no vaccine. There is no cure that is available to the masses of us. I know Trump caught that shit and got like the best healthcare available, even though he was like literally telling people to inject, inject bleach. Once he got that shit, he was like, "Give me those, give me those stem cells, give me this, this like, re like this, this research chemical, give me all of those steroids." He was like, "Give me the best of the best, the best of the best," because that man was like, "I would not die from this thing that I was trying to downplay for everybody else." So, but we are not the president of the United States. We are not wealthy. We do not have universal health care. And so that means that folks, like regular people, working class people, particularly African, indigenous, and Chicano and colonized people, are extremely at risk from this virus. We represent the majority of the deaths, the majority of the serious infections. It recently came out that the majority of the children that are dying from COVID-19 are African, indigenous, and Chicano. So it is extremely important, extremely important, that our community take this seriously that we continue to wear our masks that we continue to social distance that we continue to avoid large group settings indoors like do, please do not go to a restaurant and eat inside unless you have a death wish unless you want to like have a very very delicious approach to suicide because it's not safe to do that right now we have to understand that this government has no intention whatsoever of providing any kind of recourse of providing any kind of resources of providing any kind of support for colonized people during this pandemic on this land. And that means we have a responsibility to take those individual actions that are gonna mitigate the spread of this virus, that are gonna prevent us from catching it and spreading it to vulnerable people in our families and communities. But we also have the responsibility to move collectively to address the gaps in the government's response, to address the neglect that has, has the, the malevolent, malevolent neglect that has characterized the way that the government response to crises like this. We have to organize collectively. We have to take those individual, individual actions, like wear a mask, social distance, avoid crowded indoor spaces. But we also have to move collectively to organize to respond to this pandemic. So what we have done, as an example, within the Often People's Revolutionary Party in New Mexico chapter, is we have been feeding um, elders who it was not safe for them to like go to the Smiths um, and get groceries because they are vulnerable or they are immunocompromised. And so it's just not safe. And so since March, we have been feeding elders in Tiwa territory every single week. We organize to collect the resources, the food, shelf stable items and fresh food and healthy food. We organize to make care packages that include that food and masks and tea and cough drops and all kinds of things to support their health. We also add flyers educating them about the Offering People's Revolutionary Party, educating them about concepts like Pan-Africanism, like socialism, like revolutionary culture. And then we deliver those care packages to their homes every single week. We have done that every single week since March without skipping one. As an example of how we, as an oppressed people, we as African people can organize collectively to meet our own needs. And not only are we doing that for them every single week, like I mentioned, we're including like propaganda. We're including reads about what we're doing and who we are. And because we've done that, we've recruited one elder into our chapter who is now like an active member of APRP New Mexico. Because we're not doing this as charity. We're doing it as a revolutionary strategy to build institutions for our people that can support those people as we move towards liberation. So we're not just being like, you're welcome. We're being like, do you want to be like an active agent in this struggle to liberate our people, in this struggle to build institutions to support our people? And these elders are saying, yes, we recruited one in the and she comes to every single meeting. And we have another one who we're going to orient 
shortly. So not only are we feeding our elders every single week, but we are also recruiting them into the liberation struggle because the struggle to liberate African people is going to be multi-generational. It's going to be mass-based. And we're going to need all hands on deck. That means elders. That means youth. That means women. That means non-men. That means queer people. That means trans people. That means men. It means all of us working together, regardless of age, regardless of identity, regardless of ability, regardless of anything, except for class. Because if you are of the anti-people's class, this is not for you, and we're coming for your neck. So that's an example of the community defense work that we do to support um, the African community here in New Mexico. Um, we are also doing, engaging in uh, building a number of other projects to support our people, particularly around um, tenants' rights and eviction defense. We're going to have more details about that soon. But we are always accepting donations to support our work, our community defense work in the African community and TUI territory and beyond. And so if you want to support that work, if you want to contribute to what we're doing, if you want to help us build independent political power for African people in New Mexico and independent institutions to support our people when this government fails, then you can always donate to us on Venmo at APRP New Mexico. I'm typing this as I speak at APRP New Mexico or at PayPal at paypal.me slash APRP New Mexico. So we are taking donations always. And if you want to support, those are the, the links to do that. Also, we are constantly recruiting Africans into the organization. Like I mentioned, we got big, big plans around tenants' rights, around organizing renters. And we are going to need much more capacity to do what we have in mind. And so if you are an African person watching this show, if you are in Tiwa territory or in New Mexico and you are not active in the organization, we want to recruit you. We need your help to make this work happen. We are 10 strong. We do quite a lot. We feed a lot of people. We do this show every week. We do many, many things throughout the community. We build the organizations. We do all of that with a very small group of people. Imagine what we could do with even more. So if this work sounds exciting to you, if you want to show up, if you want to build power for African people, ooh, what happened? I hope you can still see me. Okay, cool. If you want to build power for African people here in Tiwa territory, reach out to us at APRP New Mexico at gmail.com or give us a call or text at our phone number at 505-295-0008. Once again, email us at APRP New Mexico at gmail.com or give us a call or text at 505 295 0008 and we will get you into an orientation we will tell you all about what we're doing and how you can plug in we need all hands on deck to do this work here in Tiwa territory we are trying to make sure that our people are good regardless regardless of who wins this raggedy ass presidential election in order to do that we must be organized in order to do that we must build capacity so please reach out to us please donate if you have the capacity to do so please share our streams and those donation links um, if you can and I'm sure you can, it's free. It takes just a click and support what we're doing. To wrap up the show, uh, today is Thursday, which means that there are new articles on the Hood Communist. Every single Thursday, the Hood Communist blog, of which APRP New Mexico is a part, publishes new writing from a revolutionary African perspective, written by African people, active in the struggle all over the world. Today, there are three new articles from that revolutionary African perspective that you can check out at hoodcommunist.org. <coughs> Excuse me. Drinkies. Once again, Hood Communist blog publishes new articles every single Thursday morning. So please make that like a, a part of your morning routine on Thursdays. Get some revolutionary African political education. Like I said earlier, if you want to be in solidarity with the African liberation struggle, you must understand what we're actually trying to do. And a really good way to do that is to read what the fuck we're saying. Just read the articles. Just read the articles. That'll help you. It's a good step to get an analysis of what the African liberation struggle entails, what our strategy is, what our strategies are, and what our objectives are. That is hoodcommunist.org, and that is a coalition project. It is comprised of APIP, Black Alliance for Peace, Black Hammer, and the Ujima People's Progress Party, all working together to produce this revolutionary African content. And lastly, I want to end by saying that we here in New Mexico are struggling to liberate a political prisoner. That man's name is Clifton White. 
He is the partner of Celinda Guerrero, who is the lead organizer with Millions for Prisoners New Mexico, as well as Save the Kids Southwest. Um, they are pillars in the community, pillars in the struggle against police terrorism, against uh, prisons and massive conservation here in New Mexico. Here in um, Tiwa territory, after the murder of George Floyd, there were a number of mass mobilizations. And one of the first mobilizations was organized by Millions of Prisoners of Mexico under the leadership of Slender Guerrero and Clifton White. Shortly after that mobilization that was peaceful and well organized, there was no, no property destruction, even though there's nothing wrong with that. There was no, you know, uh, confrontation with the police. It was peaceful. It was about community coming together. It was like most of the African people out there. But after that mobilization in response to the murder of George Floyd, the family of Celinda Guerrero and Clifton White was followed um, by undercover police for several days. And then they were ambushed by those police and Clifton White was arrested on parole violation. And that first, for several weeks, they would not say what that violation was and then they just like made something up that was like obvious bullshit. And so Clifton White remains incarcerated in a state prison here in New Mexico. He is frequently denied access um, to speaking to his family. He is frequently denied access to a lawyer and once again, the parole violation that they made up is not a real thing. It is very, very, very clear that this man was targeted for organizing an action against police terrorism. He was targeted in such a way to discourage not just himself, but also his partner, Celinda, and also the larger community from fighting back against state violence. That is why Clifton White is locked up. That is why they're continuing to hold him, because they are trying to attack the movement to end police brutality and the movement for African liberation on this land. And so that is why we in APIP and every single person that is social justice minded um, in New Mexico and beyond should be raising the call to free Clifton White. That man is a political prisoner. That man is being locked up for no reason. That man did nothing wrong. All he did was organize a space for his community to grieve and rise up against the oppression that we experience every single day. So I'm going to end the show by saying free Clifton White. So once again, my name is Onya Sanmu. This is a program developed by the All African People's Revolutionary Party, New Mexico chapter. The All African People's Revolutionary Party is a revolutionary mass Pan-African socialist party founded in Africa 52 years ago by Kwame Nkrumah, who has a political objective of Pan-Africanism, which we define as one unified socialist Africa, because we believe when Africa is free, African people everywhere will be free. We do this show every single Thursday at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. We talk, cover a different political education topic in depth every single week, as well as giving y'all COVID updates and African world updates. The next up of the episode of the show will be next Thursday at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. And we're going to be talking about what is revolutionary Pan-Africanism? Why are we Pan-Africanists? Why do we center Africa? How will liberating Africa liberate all African people? We're going to go all the way into it, hopefully with a special guest. So please tune in next Thursday, October 22nd for the next episode of the show. We thank you so much for watching and for your comments and for your questions and for your support. Please enjoy the rest of your day as best you can under this reactionary and barbaric system. And if you're not an organization, join an organization fighting for justice and stay ready 